Well, first and foremost, thanks for coming. Um, this has been a heck of a week for me. It hasn't even been a week yet, actually, so it's been an exciting time. Uh, many of you uh, around town know me from the University of Washington, where I was for 26 years. Uh, ended my time there in, in 2019, and since then I've been uh, working as the commissioner of the Girls Academy, a 13,000 girl league, which our OL Rain Academy participate in. Uh, I am so thrilled uh, to be in this position, and I just wanted to take the time to thank uh, the OL group and Vincent and the search committee for reaching out and um, really being transparent about everything about this position. Uh, it's uh, a lot of people would think, oh, kind of a no-brainer, but there's, you know, it's an interesting time to come to the club in the middle of the season, et cetera, and um, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I think I can hopefully be a part of their winning ways and have an impact. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with the club from day one uh, since, since they started in the NWSL with Bill and Teresa uh, back in the days of Memorial Stadium. And it's just been fun to watch the evolution from playing at Memorial to being down at Tacoma, um, the OL purchase, the movement to Lumen, now at Starfire. Uh, there's just been so much progress. I think sometimes we, we lose sight of the progress by just kind of living in the moment and everything in this club that's happened um, has been a forward movement in my opinion. So I'm excited to be a part of that. I think it's a fun um, time to be able to support the team and support the technical staff uh, in their quest to win a championship. Um, you know, to be a part of a club that's already won the Shield three times uh, you know you're coming into a situation where the expectations are very high, uh, and I'm here to try to live up to you know their expectations of me in this role. Um, so I'm I, again I'm thrilled to be here and you know to work with uh, everybody in the organization. Uh, the people I've met so far that I didn't know previously are outstanding. They're passionate about this group, and you know I know the city of Seattle is passionate about this team and this club. And it's my intention to uh, increase that awareness about the club even more um, and, you know, build an even bigger community uh, and fan base around, around this group, uh, which I don't think will be, you know, the most difficult thing. They're already at a, a really good place. All right, we'll take questions. Hi, Leslie. Hello. Um, so you mentioned it is a bit of a difficult decision. What convinced you um, to take this job, and especially because the club is up for sale and that, that makes everything just a little bit more uncertain? Yeah, um, I think people would think it would be a difficult decision because of that. I don't know if I misspoke, but it's, it wasn't a difficult decision for me. Oh, okay. Um, so for me, it was uh, it, it just the timing was right. Um, I'm at the, it was at the end of year three with the Girls Academy and, and it put in a lot of um, tireless hours with a great group of people to start that league and get it to where it is and I think they're going to do great with uh, a new form of leadership and, and I don't think without those three years under my belt just coming out of 34 years of college coaching that I was potent that I was necessarily ready for a general manager job uh, but I had been reached out to before by other clubs um, I didn't think the timing was right for me personally I wasn't overly enamored by where the league was a couple years ago to be fair and so that was one of the tipping points and the timing being perfect for me, to be honest, towards the end of the GA season and at a point where I feel the league is doing great things and really improving um, the environment for players, um, upping the standard of hires and uh, just expectations and policies in place, the CBA, uh, you know, the fight for, you know, players to be in a position to be true prof professionals. Uh, so it, it was a little bit of a no-brainer for me, um, and being home is the icing on the cake, to be honest. Um, but it wasn't the only reason. It, I believe in this club, and I, I really um, am passionate about professional sports in this city and sports in this city in general. So the, the sale piece um, was one that I, I, I didn't really think about too much in that I do feel comfortable that regardless of what happens, this club will stay in Seattle not guaranteeing that, but I have that feeling. And I, I, Seattle's a soccer city, and this club has done well, and this is a market where a professional team should be. Uh, so for me, it's, it's just, it's, it's an interesting time. The sale, middle of the season, World Cup. You go with those three things, it's just an interesting time to plop yourself <laughs> into a GM role. Uh, but I've, I've been on the job for, if you count the weekend, uh, maybe take Sunday out, five days. 
and uh, I feel great about my decision, and I, you know, I hopefully the the club feels the same way. Uh, can I ask just a quick follow up? Sorry, Jada, I did not mean to interrupt you. Um, just a along those lines, does does the club being for sale in any way make your job more difficult? Are there players who are hesitant to resign because of that uncertainty? Yeah, I've been here five days. I, I haven't felt that at all. And during my interview time, I, I did an interview with the players. The, the, these players are professional. And to, to be honest, that part never came up. It was how is someone going to come into this role with a, a general manager um, having been missing since March? Um, when Nick Pereira departed to just coming in in the middle of their season. They want to high perform today. And, you know, of course there's the future, but being here five days, I, I can't tell you um, anything specifically about how players are feeling. Uh, I know they're dedicated to winning. Um, they're pros and they're being paid to win and, and they want to be in a situation where everything around them is supporting their efforts on the field. And, and that's my intention to figure out where I can fill gaps where I can help the staff that's been, you know, working kind of, you know, tirelessly um, over the last few months to pick up maybe where where we're missing a couple spots. But uh, their their intention and my intention is to uh, be in the moment with how the, the technical staff and the players are preparing each week. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's a, a fun challenge is how I look at it. Yeah, Jada. The, um See again uh, with the uh, congratulations on the position. Thank you so <laughs> much. Appreciate it. <laughs> with that, though, um, were there? Did you have questions about the sale? What were you maybe possibly told um, about the stability of the club? And did you communicate at all with um, Nick because of the the timing of his of his leaving and then the announcement of the sale? So. Yeah, I, I did not communicate with Nick. Um, and as far as the sale is concerned, I mean, I think. Again, I've been here five days, and questions about the sale should go to the OL group themselves. Um, those aren't conversations I'm in. As far as that piece of it with the search firm and with Fonson and with Sophie Savage, um, who more Sophie than Vincent I'd had dealings with before because of the academy. Um, and so I, you know, we talked youth soccer and some other things. So I had a really, you know, prior relationship. Uh, and you know, I felt they were extremely upfront and transparent with me about that piece of it, um, and it, it wasn't one that deterred me at all. Um, you know, they're committed, they've invested, they've developed this club. I don't, you know, I think that any specific questions would have to go to them, but um, the questions I had uh, were answered during the interview process, and I felt really comfortable that they were upfront with me about what they knew and what they know to be the, the process moving forward. Congratulations on the GM role. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, what will be your ideal mission to bring players from the Youth Academy into the first team? Yeah, well, Amy Griffin has done a tremendous job with the Youth Academy, and I've seen it firsthand. I mean, I've known Amy for close to 40 years now. We worked together 24 of my 26 years at the University of Washington. Um, she's the executive director, and um, when COVID hit uh, and the U.S. soccer dropped the Development Academy for girls and boys, the boys fell into the lap of, and here's where I'll get on my soapbox, the boys fell into the lap of the MLS next, and the girls were left to twist in the wind. Uh, and I watched Amy's club go from several hundred kids to 15 overnight during a pandemic when no one was playing soccer because outside clubs, out of fear, preyed on parents and kids saying that the club was going to fold and that there wasn't going to be, no one was playing soccer. And so I watched Amy tirelessly rebuild her club and they're upwards of, I think, three to 400 players now, um, you know, two or th two teams deep in every age group. And so it's been, a re it's been a build and I've watched it and I've watched how much progress she's made in a short period of time. Some of those 15 kids that stayed were one of some of their top end players that are now seniors leaving and freshmen that are in college um, playing at the likes of Portland and UCLA, et cetera. And uh, there's gonna be a, a big connection between the first team and the academy. Uh, and I think if you speak to Amy, which I think everyone should at some point because she's a wealth of information and unbelievable at what she does, is that uh, she has so many great ideas about what it means to actually develop a player. Um, I think when you talk about youth soccer, and again, soapbox because 
just been in the midst of it for three years in in my room. <laughs> that was my job every day, I, you know, working remotely on trying to run this league and trying to hold um, academy directors to standards um, of coaching, of more importantly for girls, the environment that they're in. Um, and whether it's safe, whether it's educational, and that they're being treated as people first and players second. And there's no better example of how that is done to perfection than Amy. The quality and the competitiveness of their clubs is, is growing over time, and that's what the rebuild has been for her, and the competition in the state for players, et cetera. But there's absolutely an intention to develop kids, um, to be able to interact with, see the role models, um, be pushed up to first team training when called upon, which they have in the past, and to continue to you know, have them firsthand be able to feel what it's like to be a professional. And Harvey mentioned earlier this is your first time working directly together. Um, what's it like now uh, being under the same roof after perhaps cheering her on for so many years? Yeah, you know, Laura, um, I think I was one of the first people Laura met when she came to the States. Um, uh, Jill Ellis had told me about her and um, recommended that I tell Bill and Teresa about her. They made contact and, and they hired her. Uh, and I met her at the convention in January of that first season and we sat down and had a chat and hit it off really quickly. Uh, I think, you know, some people would come in and if Laura and I had um, a mutual respect for each other as coaches for sure, we played, you know, the Community Shields, we played those against Flotco too when I was at UW and I've just always, I've, I just want professional soccer for women in this country to succeed and for sure in the city of Seattle. I, th I think that Vincent um, and Sophie and maybe players, I don't know, would have the concern about me coming in and maybe being too familiar or, or um, you know, having uh, more of a friendship than, than a working relationship and it's just not the case. I think Laura and I have such a love of the game and a mutual respect for one another uh, that it is very simple for the two of us to have difficult conversations. It's really simple for us to have a differing opinion from one another, but all toward, you know, for the reason of trying to do what's best for the club and for the individual players. Uh, so we're thrilled. I think we're both really excited. And just in the few days um, that I've been on the job and, you know, the times that Laura and I have had interactions, and the same with Vincent and the rest of the staff, is it's just clear that the people are here look at this group of players in particular, three of whom have been here since the beginning of time <laughs> of the club, and we all just really want to do what's best by them, and and, and that takes professionalism and, you know, a, a sense of um, what your role is here in the club, and I know what my role is, and it's to help build the roster and to help um, the support staff have clarity in their roles that support the first team, and I, you know, I think Laura's confidence in me means a lot to me, and I think she knows I have confidence in her, so I think it's just a, a great combination of mutual respect where I, we can be a great team. It's fun. I'm super excited about it. They had uh, mentioned, I think Laura Lou um, had mentioned you missing being around soccer, being here, I guess, Friday for uh, training and you know, just kind of taking that in. Can you talk a little bit about that, like what, what you missed? And uh, it sounds like you were working in your house uh, for three years, or yeah, can you talk a little bit about yeah. that part? One of the last times I saw Laura was at the U20 World Cup in 2020. Not saw her, I've seen her since then a little bit, but one of the last times uh, that I was on, you know, out doing soccer work, I had left UW in 2019, and in February, March, I was at the World Cup in the Dominican Republic for the U20s. Laura was a head coach, and I was consulting for CONCACAF. And we, they won CONCACAF. We left there. I went to do a coaching license in Florida, and two days later, we all got called home because of the pandemic. And that was probably, I, I started doing, I was still doing um, coaching education for US soccer, so I was doing A licenses, which were primarily remote up until last year, almost like 90%. So yeah, my room office, um, where I ran the girls' academy, the, the times I would leave were, my, I went to the grocery store, like I was out. <laughs> but uh, I wasn't on the field with players, I wasn't socializing in a work manner with people in person, face to face, daily, I wasn't out on the field. Um, and that was a big drop off for me, to be honest, um, from, from coaching for 34 years and being around players and coaches and coaching education to just kind of cold turkey and then have it feel like when the pandemic started to end and things started to open up that I was, I was still home. 
Um, and I didn't meet my four employees until eight, seven months into my job, the four people that ended up working with me uh, when we had an event. And I'd only see them in person when we had events. So the majority of my job was done online. Thankfully for Amy and the OL Rain group, I could go out to their practices once in a while or to their fixtures and watch a game. Um, and then events would be about every other month. So I was traveling some to events, but um, the day-to-day -day in person with people on the field and the game, uh, I missed greatly. And I would say that for me, especially in the last year, I, I lost my mother about a year, a little bit over a year ago. Um, and that kind of isolation, for anyone that's ever had severe grief, <laughs> you understand that it, it gets compounded. And I would say that this last year, even in the academy, for as, as grueling as the work is and as impactful and um, exhilarating as it was to help with the startup league, for me personally, um, I needed to, to get out and about because I just wasn't used to being <laughs> that isolated, to be honest. Um, I think there's a lot of people that thrive working 100% remotely. Um, I am not one of them. <laughs> um, and so I, I think this is, you know, for all kinds of reasons, been um, great timing for me. Um, and, you know, it just so happens that it's my mother's birthday today. She would have been 84. And I know um, at 82, almost 83, before she passed, she worked up until a week before she passed away. She was a hospital administrator for 65 years and ran convalescent homes. And there was nobody that was a bigger fan or champion of mine and my life devoted to the game than my mother. And so today, it's perfect. It, it really is. It's just perfect timing and um, meant to be in a lot of ways. And it doesn't, you know, the challenge of it and the day-to-day -day kind of things in soccer that feel like an emergency are fun to me because I've, I've seen it. And I'm really just excited to get started with the club. And, get off the TV and off the video and work and be, be the team behind the team, not in front of the team. Can I ask uh, what, what your mother's name is and was that in California or was she up here? Yeah, she was in California. Yeah, and her name was June. June. Yeah, and uh, she, uh, she was something else. And, you know, if you ask my friends, <laughs> I am my mother's daughter. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, 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 a lot, I get a lot of strength from knowing how proud she'd be today of, of me continuing to do what I've loved my whole life and what I've spent um, 30, year, 30 years here in the Seattle uh, area doing. It's really fun to be reunited with the likes of Olo and Shay, who uh, Amy and I recruited at UW. Um, Mackenzie Weinert's out training with the team and she's someone who transferred into UW. And uh, Lou Pino, we play, I mean, most of these players as a coach I competed against at one point in time in my career and have worked with on youth national teams. And so it's, it's, just, it's just fun to be back around players and to be able to watch them excel at the professional level and try to do everything I can to keep pushing the game forward and find another way in my time left here, you know, in the game to have an impact. And so it couldn't be more perfect. You said that you had been uh, approached about other GM openings in the past and the time it wasn't right, you weren't ready for it. At any point, uh, was an open OL Reign GM position something that you were approached about or not? Uh, nope, this was the first time that I was approached um, by the search committee on, on this one. And I, I, I would go back and say even, um, you know, during the pandemic and right when I had left UW, um, there, were, there were a couple of, that were open that I did, you know, speak to people about who approached me. Uh, there were some international um, national team jobs that were available overseas that I was approached about to continue coaching. Uh, my mom was still living in Southern California at the time and working and I just, the pandemic and her job, I mean, the fact that she never got COVID was crazy. <laughs> working in a convalescent home at, you know, 82, 83. Um, but I, I just didn't feel like moving away um, any further than I already am from Seattle to Los Angeles was the right thing to do. And I, I, don't, I also don't think I was energized enough to start something yet. And I mentioned before, I wasn't enamored with where the league was, <laughs> to be fair. Um, and that sort of came true. And I think the, the reckoning in this league over the last 12, 15 months, whatever it's been now, um, has really shown me that the players and their voices, which we talk about a lot in the Girls Academy, and their bravery and their ability to find other people and allies to stand by them and, and um, creating policy and change and um, safeguarding 
that is what they deserve is is really cool to be a part of now. I feel I feel great being a part of this league for that reason. Would you have explored GM opportunities outside of Seattle if presented? I'm just trying to gauge like how uh, compelling the case was that this G GM job is where you live and where you're from and where you spent so much time. Around. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a, it is a big piece of it. It, it certainly makes it convenient, um, but I would also say that the knowledge of this club is a piece of that too. Um, Laura having been here before and, and come back, um, watching the progression of the club, as I mentioned before, over the last 10 to 11 years has been fun to see. Um, and this is home to me. I, I, I care about this club specifically. Some of the other roles and, um, and, and you know, compelling, but not compelling enough for me to relocate at the time I was approached. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, I don't, you know, I'm hopeful I wasn't the convenient hire. I don't think I was, um, but it's certainly, like I said before, I think it was meant to be, and I've been um, humbled by the enthusiasm around the announcement. All right, we're gonna take a couple questions on Zoom and then if we have more in person. Taylor, you can go ahead on Zoom. Hi, thanks for chatting with us today. Um, wanted to talk a bit about the future. Um, you've got 20 players whose contracts end the day, um, end of the season. Uh, kind of what is your thought on where you want the club to go? Should we expect to see a bunch of signings? Um, are you going to be trying to get some new blood in? Uh, kind of what is your path in that way? Yeah, so what did I say this was? My fourth day? <laughs> uh, obviously, it's a big discussion. You know, the priority, more importantly, right now. I mean, there's obviously priorities with the roster and the future build out and looking at what the length of the contracts are, who's performing, having discussions with um, with the technical staff and, and, you know, what we see down the line um, being important to the club and the build out. Uh, but the World Cup is also an important time of being in the middle of the season and making sure that um, national team replacement players um, are in place sooner than later is important. So we're working on that. As far as specifics to the roster, um, I, I can't, it's not that I won't give them, but there aren't, I don't have enough details right now because I've only been on the job technically three weekdays. <laughs> so um, we can come back to that here, you know, over the next bit and we can certainly talk more about what the roster is going to look like. Um, I have a, a really pretty clear idea in my head of where we are. And I know this club, having won the Shield three times, wants to continue to compete for Shields and most importantly for NWSL championships. And so what that looks like um, is what we'll be talking about just about every day. My first big meeting um, on, on the current roster um, and where we are with numbers and where the contracts are and free agency and all of that is, uh, is tomorrow. Susie, go ahead. Hi, Leslie. Hey, Susie, how are you? I'm good, how about you? Good. Um, I was struck by, um, I'm sure your phone was sort of blowing up in this last week, just how many comments you were getting from players, coaches, parents of the Girls Academy, and I'm just wondering, um, you started in the middle or at the like highest point of the pandemic in that role. What sort of things or lessons are you taking with you from that time into this job? Uh, so many, I can't even tell you. Uh, I, I th the managerial job, um, just the word manager. So as commissioner of the league, I feel as though, you know, managing people during the pandemic was a challenge for everybody. Managing four new people that you'd never met and worked with them over Zoom, trying to start something that was a huge risk uh, was, it, it just, it was so much hard work over the last three years for all of us. But it was work we were all aligned in with the passion to make it happen for these kids. And so we never really lost sight of that. And so for me, um, I, I just, I, I feel like every bit of the job that I did with the board, with the club directors, with the players in that league and with my staff um, it was, a, it was culminated in me being way more prepared for this job than I ever would have been coming out of UW as a coach. Um, from dealing with, uh, you know, the standards of the game, the safeguarding piece for 13,000 kids, uh, trying to manage the budgets, trying to make sure that the standards um, within the league were upheld, and without being in every single club environment, making sure, again, that kids were safe and being protected while they're playing youth soccer. 
uh, is, is probably one of the most difficult tasks we all have in this country in youth sports is um, taking on that responsibility. So partnerships with the league, um, convincing people that we were worth it to partner with um, was another challenge that we had. So uh, everything I did over the last three years with the group I did it with was, um, was a lesson for me. I started the league telling them my, my mantra has always been there's no such thing as a soccer emergency. And coming, <laughs> coming out of the pandemic, the first event we were able to have was in February in Round Rock, Texas. And I don't know if you all remember 2021 in Round Rock, Texas, uh, the power grid of all of the state of Texas went out. Well, that was in our first event. And so I may have been curled up in a ball in my room <laughs> texting my director of ops saying, okay, <laughs> there might be emergencies in soccer. <laughs> there's, there's no potable water, there's no energy, there's families of 15 moving into this hotel where we are right now. It feels kind of emergent. <laughs> she, she laughed, but you know, once we were kind of out of the clear, things only went up from there. So if we could, uh, we could pull that off, um, we felt like we were on the right track to, to kind of you know, put our stake in the ground as a league. And we're, I'm just really proud of the work we were all able to do during that time, but it, it absolutely, um, prepared me for everything that has um, to do with management within the game of soccer. You know, from networking with people, um, negotiating with people, making sure that fiscally you're responsible. There's, there's so many pieces to it. And at the end of the day, it all revolves around uh, the players and putting them in an environment where they can perform at their best. No. Just one quick follow up for me. I think um, a lot of um, the reckoning that's happened in the NWSL over the last couple of years, there's also been elements of racism um, that have kind of been underlying a, a, a against all of that. And I'm just wondering, like, how do you think about how you support players, like all players, but in particular, um, making sure that players of color are, are, are really supported in the environment? How have you thought about approaching that? Yeah, I mean, we talked about this in our league a lot, and we have a long way to go. I just think we have a long way to go in this country in general, in sport, in life. We just do. Uh, and, you know, I've always taken the approach that, uh, particularly someone of my experience and wisdom, we'll put it that way, <laughs> I've been around a little bit, is that I just listen. I, you know, I really try to be someone who listens and takes the time to learn myself. Uh, I try to... Uh, make sure that you know that that the work that needs to be done to educate myself and to educate others is not the burden of someone who shouldn't be doing the educating. Uh, and so, in the league, we've talked about that a lot as well. I, I it was I would tell you that over the last three years, I sit on the equity action committee with um, a, a player group, uh, an academy director group from the MLS, and. What a great group of people, and and I, I I live for those zooms every week because I was just able to hear um, shared stories from people who have faced um, challenges their whole life because of the color of their skin, and I would say that it was probably be in my top five takeaways was being a part of that group, um, and it was formed right after George Floyd, uh, and I you know I've tried as much as I can to be a part of change um, and so for this group and for even the club and the staff and everything else it's going to be something that we look at from a hiring policies process to um, you know what the representation is across the board in the club and how people are treated on a daily basis but it goes back to what I said originally is just having my ears and eyes open and being willing to learn myself um, and trying to call out what's not right when I see it. All right, we'll Thank take one. So we'll take yeah. one from Jackie, and then we have another in-person question, Jackie. Thank you. Hey, Leslie, long time no see. <laughs> Jackie. Uh, <laughs> I know. Congratulations. Thank again. you very um, much. Yeah, I know you were talking earlier about just the growth at the club level, and um, you know, from the early days at Memorial Stadium, and then of course to the bigger picture of the NWL as a whole and so just coming into this role in general um, I know again you're like 40 is it but what are you just most looking forward to in terms of just um, your role moving forward? Yeah I, I think you know just continuing to evolve and take the standards to a higher level you know um, we talked about after the OL purchase getting to Lumen coming back from Tacoma 
um, and also now being in Starfire and having their own training facility, which they didn't really have. Um, you know, the Sounders moving to Long Acres, so being able to take over um, more of the space and, and the build out and what that looks like, and more importantly, just the continued professionalization of all of it. And and to be fair, not just within the club, but also it, it's going to be great to be. Um, a voice in the room on some of the committees within the NWSL. Uh, the good news about my commissioner role at the GA is I've been able to interact already with um, Jessica Berman and Tatiana Haney at, you know, and Steph Lee. Like, those are people that I've, I've known from the past and I have relationships with. So, and, and as well as a lot of the GMs, the majority of the GMs are people that I know from the game and just being around. So we're all really, uh, I, I think, as much as everyone wants to compete and win, and it is becoming an extreme, I mean, there's a lot of parity in the league, but it's becoming extremely um, competitive from club to club and attracting players and the things you have and the people you hire and the structure within your club, all those things, you have to keep up or you're gonna, you're gonna get left behind. But I think the most important thing is to be in a room with people, even though they're competitive, uh, to win games on the day and try to win the league is we're we're all very much in it for the greater good of the game for women in this country um, and for the league. So it's really fun to be a part of this group. We had our first I, I, my first day. I was already on a GM call and it was I, I don't think I said anything. I listened primarily, but I might have made a couple jokes to some friends that were on the call. But uh, I'm excited for the next one because I think there's a lot of policy. Uh, and a lot of the things, again, with the newer commissioner that they're looking at, and it'll just be great to be in the room to be able to, to help strategize around what's best for the league. Well, I appreciate your time, and congratulations again. Thanks, Thanks Jackie. Jackie. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, it's Pride Month. We have a Pride uh, match coming up. Um, talked with Jess and um, Ziara a little bit about how important it was to play for a club that really stands by its values publicly and uses its voice. Um, how important is it for you to work for a club that has those sorts of values and does share them so broadly and, and use its voice for good? Extremely important, yeah. I just think that, you know, inclusivity, it, it, it's, <laughs> to me, it's, and I, I only laugh because it's just, um, it's just shocking to me that the opposite of inclusive is exclusive and why in this world would we ever want to be exclusive you know to anyone for any reason um, and so it, it, it's been that way in this club from the beginning and uh, it it is it's extremely meaningful not just to me personally but to the people I know who have struggled to find inclusive environments um, so to be a part of one that is um, for any player that's ever rostered here uh, you know, you don't keep everyone forever. So if they leave, or they retire, or they go to play for another club, or they're a try list, or you draft them and you don't sign them, our goal, my goal, is for every player that steps into this locker room or into this club feels like they were treated um, equally to everyone else for whatever reason. Uh, <clears throat> so all over the world, women's soccer has been growing at a faster and faster rate, especially some leagues in Europe. I was wondering what your approach will be when it comes to bringing in players from abroad, such as Europe or England or even South America. Yeah, we're going to, you know, we have a few internationals on our roster already. So in the World Cup is this summer, so I'll be watching closely. Uh, and I do think there are diamonds in the rough. And I also think there are big name players that will be really attracted to the NWSL as they start to notice, with the exception of a couple leagues, uh, ours has probably more parity from top to bottom. So regardless of what team you play on, you're playing a, a really high level match every every fixture, every week, um, as opposed to maybe waiting for those two or three that are really, really challenging. Um, you know, the, the, the Women's League in England is obviously probably one that's starting to, I mean, they're getting bigger crowds, the, you know, it, it's done really, really well, but still from top to bottom, it, it has a little bit of growth to do uh, as far as the, the teams being more competitive more competitive from top to bottom, uh, but it's all of it's great. Uh, you know, whatever country, you know, women's leagues uh, starting in African nations, women's leagues starting in the Middle East, women's leagues starting, you know, uh, Canada maybe. <laughs> so, so you know, there, it's just exciting to me. And so I, I think this player movement um, domestically, player movement internationally, is what we want. 
you know, and I th I'm going to work really hard to, um, I wouldn't say re-educate myself, but jump back into the thick of it. I've always been a fan. I've always been a, a coach. I've always been someone who's watched with a, a critical eye of players that are on the rise. And uh, I'm excited. You know, I was supposed to probably go to the World Cup this summer. I'm still debating whether to use some of my tickets. I haven't bought a plane ticket, but um, use some of my tickets and go, or just to, you know, make sure I'm watching the games that I think potentially have have players for for the future for this club but it's uh it's just a really exciting time uh, you know the more opportunities for women to play the game wherever professionally is or just to play the game even as amateurs is a positive i've been in this game my entire life and you know there's people in the moment that are always um at times trying to find the you know the the negative or just sort of the you know the hot topic and uh, I just kind of giggle because you have to always look back at where it started and where it is now. And it's so fun that we can have <laughs> these conversations because the growth of this sport has been one of the great joys of my life to watch since I played. All right, we'll take one more from Jada. <clears throat> Excuse me. This, um, I believe you would be, you would count as like a fourth maybe GM, uh, considering like the separation from Bill and Laura and Nick. So like what, and it seems like the, the um, responsibilities are still like evolving. So can you share exactly like what are you going to do your responsibilities? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out today. No, I'm kidding, Gina. It's uh, right now that my, you know, the the group that um, that I'll be overseeing is the medical group, um, and then the first team and the first team staff, as well as the operational staff. And so, you know, that group is in my charge. And uh, I, you know, people and I obsess sometimes too about org charts and reporting lines and who does, you know. But I, I, I think as this club has evolved and continues to evolve, it's probably one of the things I'm most excited about is getting in here and figuring out how we actually operate on a daily basis and how that way of operating is positive for the players and how that way of operating maybe hinders them or just doesn't you know, um, tick all the boxes for them to be able to just go about their business of taking care of themselves and performing on game day and to, to make everything around them, not easier because what they do is really hard, but to uh, move any obstacles out of the way that they shouldn't have to be seeing on a daily basis or experiencing. Uh, and, and again, to just make them feel like professionals. <laughs> you know, there's still a long way to go with it, with everything in this league. And the CBA was a big step forward. And, you know, so now that that's in place, what's the, what's the next step? The salary caps, the, the buy-in for the league, the expansion, the, you know, prize money for certain things and their ability, you know, for every, not everyone, but for, you know, multiple people on rosters to be able to get their own personal sponsorships with, you know, just the professional, professionalization of women's sports. And so, uh, you know, I, I mentioned it before, it's the exciting thing for me is to just get on the train of taking it forward and all those things that um, are out there for the sport that um, are, are there for the taking, you know, uh, from an organizational standpoint, we want to be an elite club, not just in the NWSL, but an elite club in the world. Um, the American women and the U.S. in general um, has been at the forefront of this sport since the beginning. And, you know, we have been the example for a lot of other countries and people like to talk about how we've been caught or they're catching up and we'll see how the World Cup goes. Again, all of that is great. Uh, but, you know, here in the U.S. in our league, we're going to try to get the best players we can from wherever they come from to make this the league that people want to be in. All right, um, if your questions